to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation as usual as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about Everyone. Welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay. And for those of you that are new, Alzheimer Speaks is about sound information, not just sound bites. We want to have real conversations with real people, large and small, all around the world, from those diagnosed to those um, caring for them, family and professionals, researchers, advocates, uh, kids, you name it, everyone is welcomed here on Alzheimer's Speaks. And if you liked our opening music, it's called Clearing Call by the Mark Arneson Band. You can download that on any of your favorite music platforms. Now, before we get started, I always like to do a couple of shout outs. One, I want to talk about Dementia Map. If you're not familiar with it, check it out. I am so proud of it. We have 150 different categories that people can search and it's growing every day. We're just spreading the word, uh, word of mouth, and it's just been really fun to, to see people's response to it, both professionals and families, because everything that can help us is no longer in our backyard. We have access to information all around the world. So check out DementiaMap.com. I'm going to give a couple of shout outs to some upcoming events. So tomorrow I will be facilitating a support group. We call it uh, Caregiver Connect, which is sponsored by Brookdale of North Oaks here in Minnesota. Uh, we do this the last Wednesday of each month at 10 a.m. at the Shoreview Community Center. And then in the afternoon on the second and fourth Wednesdays of each month, we do Arthur's Memory Cafe. And that is going to be a virtual meeting so anybody in the world can join us. That is at one o'clock central time. So that would be two uh, Eastern noon mountain time and 11 a.m. Pacific. But no matter where you are, you are welcome. Just reach out to me and I will get you information on that. Also, there are two international conferences that I'm so proud to be part of. The first one is the Plymouth International Virtual Dementia Conference. And they're going to be talking about challenges and solutions for this COVID world that we're living in. And it's going to run three days, October 27th, which is the day I will be speaking, November 3rd and November 10th. It is totally free. And then also on November 2nd, the research charity Brace is going to be exploring dementia as a global challenge and offering a range of fantastic speakers that you can check out. And that has a, a minimal fee. I want to say it's like uh, $10, $15. Both of them, if you go to alzheimerspeaks.com, you'll get direct links and you can uh, see you know, what the programs are and if that's of interest to you. We're going to hear from the Foot Bar Walker and we're going to be right back. Introducing the life-changing Foot Bar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle? to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. I highly encourage you if you know of anyone in need of a walker to check out the foot bar walker they can find that on dementiamap.com just put in foot bar in in the keyword on the resource directory uh, there's a special now they can use a discount and they can actually get this walker for 
199.99, and it really does help uh, decrease injuries, both for the patient as well as the care partner. So let's introduce our guest today. Well, welcome back, everyone. I am so excited to introduce our guest today. We have Dr. Joy Pascozum with us, and she is a, this fabulous woman. I, I'm so thrilled to have her. She is known by most of her clients as Dr. Joy. And I can say just by talking to her, I know why, because her personality is really uplifting. And if you're scared of the dentist, this is a woman to go see <laughs> because she's going to take that edge off for you. She has been providing uh, dental care to Alzheimer's and dementia patients for over 10 years now in Chicagoland while maintaining her brick and mortar practice. She actually does home visits as well, which is really, really rare. And she's an educator. So not only to her staff in terms of how to deal with things, but nursing homes, um, other professionals and family members in terms of the importance of oral care. And, you know, when you're dealing with somebody who can't communicate, and I can really appreciate that because my own mother, we stopped giving oral care to because she was so scared of things and we didn't know how to deal with it. And it would like wreck her whole day. So mm. I'm really looking forward, Joy, to learning more from you. So thanks so much for, for joining us today. What a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, I always start out with every one of my guests by asking one simple question, and that is, have you been personally touched by Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia in your own family or circle of friends? We are beginning to consider having my mom tested. Um, we are uh, looking into the possibility that she is beginning to suffer from uh, Alzheimer's uh, or potentially even vascular dementia. And uh, yeah, so it's been, it's been in early discussions but I think by the end of the year, we are going to request to have a test done. Yeah. Okay. Well, and just know that'll probably be three or four months out before you can even get in to get tested. So, True that. True <clears throat> that. Um, I wanted to start out with what, what do we need to know that we don't know about oral care? Because I think when it comes to dementia or any chronic illness or, or even dental care. I mean, if you're not trained, there's a lot we don't know in those areas. So what don't we know and what, what do we need to know and why? Absolutely. I think the most critical part about oral care is realizing that in order to eat, we need our teeth or some version of teeth, aka uh, dentures, partial dentures, implants along those lines. And the problem is, is that um, we don't always know what's in our loved one's mouths. We don't know if there is a partial denture or if there is a complete denture um, and how they were taking care of it. Sometimes we didn't, you know, they don't even know, we don't even know who the original dentist was that potentially had done dental work for um, our loved ones that we care for. So I think the most important thing is to have that discussion, to focus on that because we dentistry is all about prevention. We, we want to make sure that we have all our ducks in a row so that if there are problem does arise, we will know how to address it because we've been familiarized with what's going on in our loved one's mouths. Uh, for example, um, I was in a situation where I was uh, called to come see a, a stroke victim who was, uh, had become paraplegic and nonverbal. Um, they were brushing, the loved ones were brushing uh, her teeth, um, and, but they noticed an odor coming from her mouth and they had me come and, you know, picture this, you know, the, the, the lovely woman is, is in her bed. I've got, I'm at the, like the 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock position. And I have the daughter, the granddaughter, and then the rest of the family surrounding the bed because everyone is so, um, you know, they, they cared so much about their, their matriarch of their family. Uh, and I took one look at her and I lifted up her upper lip and I realized that it was an upper denture. And then I dropped her lower lip and I saw that it was a lower denture. So this poor woman for two years has not had her dentures taken out because they didn't know that their mother, grandmother had complete dentures. She was completely without teeth. And that is what, you know, then they were stunned. They were absolutely stunned. At first, at first the daughter's like, well, that's impossible. 
she would have told me, well, no, not necessarily. She's a widow. She was a very formal person. And she didn't want anyone to know that she had gone through this type of dental treatment. So I dropped the lower denture. I you know, showed her and the rest of the family left because you can imagine the smell, not to get gross, but it was kind of smelly. The lower denture I took out as well. And it really was my first case for me to make me realize that this was not neglect. They were brushing her teeth, her teeth twice a day. This is not complete ignorance on the situation of what was going on in their loved one's mouth. The hospital never bothered to either notice or tell them. Uh, maybe the assumption was made that they already knew. But then you also have the situation where the home health care providers didn't look either. And what I've learned uh, in, in my uh, experience over these last 10 years is that they're not trained on what to look for when it comes to the mouth. Somehow the mouth is kind of skipped over. And the assumption is that people, if they can eat and there's no dramatic loss of weight uh, or nothing really significant to where the person is able to communicate to say, hey, I've got a toothache over here, or this one's bothering me when I have something cold, then it tends to be ignored. Uh, and, and that is, that is a real problem. And so that's, that's, yeah. So we don't know what we don't know when it comes to oral care, because it's often overlooked. And also because the, uh, um, certified, um, the CNAs, the certified nursing assistants and other caregivers aren't trained, aren't educated on what to look for in the mouth, uh, for any potential problems. Well, yeah, they're just poking a toothbrush in. They're not yeah. pulling down the lip to see if there's anything overlapping. It's hilarious that you use that example because I was going to ask you, because I've heard this happen so often. Have you ever um, run into a case where someone's dentures are, are they're almost like glued in from the food in the gunk and they can't even get them out get once them out. they realize Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's so true where, where the food literally becomes the suction mm -hmm. between the denture and the roof of the mouth and, or the, or the, you know, the lower jaw. Oh, absolutely. I've seen that. Um, and then the, the, the uh, infections that can come from that is the, the most common one is called denture stomatitis. And, and that is where you have, literally have a fungal infection. You have fungus mm -hmm. growing in between the denture and the roof of the mouth. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I would imagine you see all kinds of broken teeth. I know, like my mom, I would describe to her friends, because again, we chose to stop because we were, they were trying to brush the teeth and she would get so angry and upset. It would wreck like half her day. We went to the swabs, we went to the washes, all of that stuff. And she just didn't understand. And I think she felt really pressured and mm. kind of abused because of the, the techniques that were being used. And so, you know, when my, my mom's friends would come and I, I would say, well, I have to prep you because my mom always had great pearly white. She was really proud of them. And I said, they kind of look like a rusted chainsaw with fried rice hanging off them now. <laughs> and, and I said, but she still has this great, beautiful smile. You just got to get, you, you just don't look at the teeth, look at the smile, look at the dimples, look at everything else, you know, but, you know, her joy is still there. But you know, that was a choice we made. And we were looking towards, you know, the nursing home staff and things to help with that. And we really didn't get any direction. And so then it came down to a quality of life in terms of what is her everyday going to be like, and we said, okay, let the teeth go. And then the dentist stepped in and said, well, we can pull all those and we can give her dentures. And and I'm like, no, because at that point, she, she still thought she had pearly white teeth and she would feel the difference. And the dentist was like, oh no, she will never feel the difference. And I'm like, oh yeah. And he's like, well, how, why do you say that? And I explained this story of my mom used to eat a peanut butter parfait until the nuts were rocks. Then we went to a blizzard and then there was pebbles. And then we just went to McDonald's and got a hot fudge sundae. But she could tell the difference in the texture. Mm. And he was shocked that she would know that. And I said, plus, she was at the point, she would never know how to put them in. They'd be in somebody's mouth or a drawer. And, you know, he, his philosophy was, well, don't worry, you don't have to pay for it. And I'm like, no, this That's is about comfort. Point. This is about comfort care. 
you know, at this point with my mom and, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're nodding and that you don't see me as crazy. Cause I argued with that guy for like an hour and a half. I mean, it was horrible. And finally I just said, stop, it's not happening. See, there's, there's two things I want to, I want to address there. And the, and the first thing is sometimes less is more, mm-hmm. you know, we want to make sure that there is failure to, or, or we don't want to have failure to thrive, right? We want, we want someone who's happy, who's eating and is comfortable in their own skin and comfortable to, in the condition that they're in and comfortable with the people around them and their surroundings and their daily habits, right? Mm-hmm. That is, that is utmost, the most important thing that I can possibly say when it comes to, when it comes to oral care, sometimes less is more. I had a situation where exactly same situation, but it was the other way around where the, where the granddaughter, um, excuse me, no, the daughter really wanted to make sure that her mom had upper teeth, that she had lost her denture in the process of moving from home to a, an assisted care facility, actually it was a skilled nursing home. And uh, she desperately wanted her to have another denture. Her mom was mid to to late stage Alzheimer's. Um, She knew her name. Uh, She was nonverbal. And she, you know, but she was very amenable, very agreeable to, to anything. And she's like, please, please, please. My grandsons do not want to see her without her teeth. Can you make them so that she can still have a relationship with her grandsons and vice versa? So I did, I made an upper complete, she was wonderful about it. It takes five appointments to make an upper complete denture or partial denture or any denture. It takes at least five appointments, made the, made the denture. Um, and I remember inserting it uh, right, right after dinner. So we were still in the, the cafeteria. It was myself, uh, the, the resident and the, her caregiver. And I remember inserting it and it was a wonderful, it was perfect. Like the caregiver was a gas. Like she was like, oh my God, this looks just like her teeth. And I had pictures and all that stuff. So I knew, beautiful. And she's like, you know, you have a wonderful evening. I'm like, Mm-mm, I'm going to stick around. I want to make sure. And she's like, make sure about what? And I'm like, Let, let's just give it a second. So, you know, she's kind of, you know, the resident's kind of do to do. And she gets up and she sees that there's some balloons that were, you know, weighted down on a table. Obviously, it had been another resident's birthday. So she goes over there, takes a denture out of her mouth, puts it on the table, takes the balloons and brings them over to me as a gift. <laughs> and I'm like, and I turn to the caregiver and I'm like, we have a problem because she does not recognize the teeth as something to stay in her mouth. I said, you are going to be on her at all times to make sure that this denture stays in her mouth. I've had another situation where I have made a a denture and takes it out, hands it back to me and says, this is not mine. Mm -hmm. Where is my, where did my denture go? And in a state, because this wasn't their denture. And there's, there was no matter of coaxing to explain that this was their denture. Um, and then in that situation, there was a loved one with them. It was the son and he was beside himself. He's like, no, 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 mom. And was getting angry. And I said, I don't know if that's really the right, you know, path to take. It's just going to agitate her more. We can try again, you know, later we can try again tomorrow. Suffice to say the woman never wore that denture because she didn't, you know, recognize the fact that this was her new one. It was not hers. In her memory, that is not her denture. And there was nothing that was going to make her wear it. So in those situations, sometimes less is more. And I say that all the time. The other part I wanted to say is there is something to be said about taking the time and and promoting a concept called tell, show, do. Tell, show, do is when you, and we do this for pediatrics a lot, and it has really been taken over by, by geriatrics as well. It's where you tell the resident or the loved, your loved one that I'm going to brush your teeth and, you know, you hold the denture in front of them and you even have them hold the denture or hold the, hold the toothbrush, hold the toothbrush in front of them, or maybe have them hold a toothbrush and you've got another toothbrush you're going to use. And you show them that you're putting on the toothpaste or put, and you maybe even put some toothpaste on the one that they're holding. And you say, okay, Molly, I'm going to be brushing your upper right teeth. And you show them, you point and you start to brush. And, you know, certain times they're clenching, but they're allowing you to brush the outside of the teeth. You know what? Fantastic. I'm getting 50% of that tooth. That is better than nothing. Okay, Molly, now I'm going to brush the lower right. You tell them first, you point, 
You let them feel it on the outside, you show them and you drop the toothbrush and you brush the lower. A lot of times I'll do this in having the patient in front of the mirror so that they can actually watch me do this. And I have had wonderful success in doing that. I also try very hard not to be hovering over them. I'm tall, I'm 5'11". So a lot of times I'm kneeling next to their wheelchair. A lot of times, you know, these people are no, you know, these loved ones are no longer being a- able to walk or stand, have the capacity to stand in front of their, you know, in their bathrooms. So I'm kneeling next to their, to their wheelchairs while I'm doing this so that we can be eye to eye. We are equals. And I never want them to think that I'm talking down to them, that we are making direct eye contact at the same level that they are. And then I'll go over to the left and then so on and so forth. And like I said, sometimes they're, you know, they're protecting themselves. They've got that defense mechanism. They're, they're clenching, but they're allowing me to do what they feel, what they feel comfortable with. And mm-hmm. to me, that is a success. That is a huge success. And if it's done twice a day, oh, if it's only done once a day, so be it. But I do, that's part of, you know, educating the, the staff is showing them what I'm doing. I'm like, yes, this is going to take you twice as long. Mm-hmm. I got that. And I know you've got eight, nine, 10 other residents that you have to be working with this morning. I get that. But for this particular resident, she needs this amount of time and amount of, you know, care. And I promise you by doing this on a more regular basis, the tell the showing and the doing, you're going to have to do that every day because, you know, memory is, you know, is, is, um, is this not there anymore? They're not going to remember it, but they're going to be more comfortable in having it done. And, um, there has been wonderful success in, in having, uh, having done that, especially in the mornings, obviously with sundowning and everything at night might be more difficult, but in the mornings, especially after breakfast, their, their belly is full. They're, they're, you tend to be calmer. We can get that done. And I've seen wonderful results. Well, and the thing too, is, you know, when they, when they go in and try to do it quick and then they give, give up because someone's pushing back. Now oh, sure. You, now you've irritated them. And what Absolutely. I have found- especially with my own mom who lived with dementia for 30 years, she might not remember a lot, but she'll remember she's angry and she's, yeah. and she'll, she'll, and you're the one who it. did it. And you're the one, you're the cause it, of the anger. Exactly. So that, and so when she sees that person, it triggers, it triggers that emotion back. Absolutely. Up. So, you know, what you're saying makes so much sense um, to me. And I would imagine you see abscesses too, where again, we rely on people to say, oh, I've got a cavity, I've got this. But I mean, even like with myself, I have really deep um, sinus cavities. Mm. So when I'm on the verge of a sinus infection, I'm like, oh my gosh, my teeth are killing me. And I I just did this again, not too long ago, I went into the dentist and, um, and I actually cleared it up prior because I used a a, like a facial like scrubbing brush and I went under here and then it, it released that but nice. I said I still went into the dentist to make sure because I wasn't sure which it was and he's like nope it was your sinus cavities and he you know showed me on my x-ray how he's like I've never seen sinus cavities this, this low you lucky girl <laughs> yeah yeah so I mean weird things can happen but yes. when we're relying on somebody, especially mid to late stages, they can't tell us they'll feel pain, they'll exhibit reactions, but it might not be to the area that they're having the discomfort on. So thank you for sharing all that. The other thing is, you know, during like hospice or palliative care, a lot of times people just kind of push everything away. And do you still feel that oral care is important during that time as well? Absolutely. As long as they're still eating, Unfortunately, unfortunately, <laughs> we still need to brush, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, because it's, especially at the time when they potentially are the most vulnerable brushing teeth, or even if we can get them to rinse with, with an appropriate mouthwash that is, that is appropriate for them, then, then yes, absolutely. Oral care is, is crucial because we want the mouth as clean as possible. We still want them to be able to eat. I I know I've used this term several times. I'm going to use it again. We want to make sure there's no failure to thrive. At at least we don't want the source of the problem to be be, is because they're having a problem in their mouth that they can't communicate communicate to us with and, and have that be the issue that is going to make them deteriorate even faster, um, even faster, period. 
so yes, brushing, brushing the teeth, you know, during, during hospice is so incredibly important. And I know that hospice run really runs the gamut mm -hmm. on, on, um, what the, what criteria are and what the uh, individual is, is going through, what the conditions have brought them to, uh, to become in hospice. But I'll give another example. I had a woman who um, was, in a hosp it was in hospice in a particular hospice uh, community. And uh, she was complaining of a toothache uh, and they couldn't understand how she could possibly have a toothache because she was on morphine, right? Mm -hmm. So it turns out, well, morphine doesn't do much, unfortunately, for toothaches. Uh, came in, saw what the problem was, um, did a round of antibiotics because there was an abscess involved and she commit, couldn't communicate what the problem was. And there wasn't any swelling. You couldn't tell from the outside of the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and they, and the, the caregivers, lovely people, they didn't know what to look for. Mm -hmm. Once again, not trained in oral care. So I, you know, was immediately, you know, put this person on an antibiotic and also to make sure they were put on ibuprofen, that this particular person could be on ibuprofen, um, to help with the pain. And then, we brushed her teeth and the nurses went like, they were like, oh my God. And I'm like, well, she can still rinse and spit. I'm communicating with her. She, we did a fantastic job. She was able to pink, you know, choose between a pink and a yellow toothbrush. She picked pink and, and we, you know, we brushed her teeth and it was wonderful. And I, and, and as I'm putting things away from the corner of my eye, I can see her do this. She difference. could tell the difference of how good that mouth felt after we brushed the teeth. Am I going to be able to do this every single time with a hospice patient? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But it's still incredibly important to be focusing on the mouth in, for daily care. Um, mm -hmm. If we are washing their hair, if we are bathing them, the brushing the teeth go hand in hand. Okay. You know, one of the other issues that I hear from people all the time is that they have dry mouths. Mm. Do you run across that with people and, and what causes that? I, that's got to be very uncomfortable. Oh, absolutely. And dry mouth, let me tell you, especially for people with chronic conditions. So when I mean chronic conditions, it could be something as simple as high blood pressure. 85% mm -hmm. of all medications that are taken for chronic conditions, and that runs a gamut from high blood pressure to COPD to diabetes can cause dry mouth is one of the side effects, especially of being taken longer than three months to nine months. And even more, especially if the dosage is raised, then those side effects really come into play. And we tend to see this more often in women and, than men. Um, mm -hmm. that, but that being said, you know, um, I see it with men too. And there's two different types of dry mouth. And I think this is also very crucial to, to mention as well. There's quality of saliva and there's quantity of saliva. And quantity of saliva is what most people see or think of when they think of dry mouth. But the problem is that it's not just the quality or quantity, it's the quality as well. The quality meaning that Normal saliva is supposed to be thin, it's supposed to be clear, and it's what the job of the saliva to do is, number one, to help break down foodstuffs and create a you know, lubrication in our mouth to allow us to chew the food, have the food broken down so they're soft, and allow us to swallow. Mm -hmm. But if the quality of the saliva isn't there, if it's thick, if it's ropey, if it's cloudy, then that lubrication isn't as good as it used to be. And it can actually be an irritant. It can cause us to feel like we always have something in the back of our throats where we need to cough up phlegm. And yeah, some people have post-nasal drip. You know, I, I see that all the time or allergies or any other kind of, you know, chronic nasal conditions, you know, can occur. That being said, most of the time that I'm called in, it's because the quality of the saliva isn't good. It, they're not having an ability to break down that foodstuffs as well as they used to. They're eating at the same pace they used to five, 10 years prior. And now, you know, it's getting difficult to, to swallow or, and they're having a problem with breathing and, and swallowing at the same time. So saliva is so crucial in being able to, um, in being able to eat and drink. So one of the things that I recommend all the time is simple over-the-counter products. And I just suffice to say that I'm not being sponsored <laughs> for, for this, I, but these are the things that I've seen, you know, work for me. 
or and for my and for my um, my my patients is that biotin b i o t e n e biotin is an over the counter mouthwash, toothpaste, and gel, and all three products are swallowable. Now on the bottle is gonna say, this is not meant for consumption. That is true. There's a significant difference between consuming a product like you're pouring into a glass and now you're going to drink a whole glass of water. It's not meant to do that. What I recommend is for those that are really suffering before a meal is to do a shot of it. You know, what is that? You know, five ounces to do a shot of it, you know, have it swish in their mouth and then swallow it about five minutes before a meal. This coats the mouth, this, it, it works with the saliva, it coats the mouth, and now it's also coating the back of the throat, so they should be able to eat better. And, you know, potentially along with a swallowing specialist or, you know, a nurse care practitioner or whoever they're working with in the healthcare, you know, field medically. Um, this is a wonderful way to help them continue to eat and swallow the foods that they've always wanted to eat. Um, also, when it comes to quantity as well, saliva, or excuse me, biotin does not produce saliva. Okay, that's, uh, there's an actual prescription that we can prescribe. I think I've done it one time. Mm -hmm. I've seen wonderful results with the over, over the counter products. And that is one of them. And that's for people that cannot respond to, you know, hey, Molly, you know, okay, we're going to rinse, but we're going to spit now too. For the people that are mid to late that are not really following directions as easily as they used to, biotin is a wonderful product because if they do swallow it, it's okay. It's pH neutral. It's considered a topical. It doesn't interfere with any uh, medications that they're taking. And it also doesn't interfere with digestion because it's very easy on the tummy. It's pH seven. Um, the biotin toothpaste also exists. Once again, if you're concerned about swallowing toothpaste, they can cause, you know, upset tummies. Absolutely. Biotin doesn't have any fluoride in it, so it's not going to help protect against cavities, but you're also, you know, not going to be concerned about, you know, having, you know, tummy upset because of uh, the fluoride in the toothpaste. And then you've got the gel. The gel is wonderful. I use the gel. And the dead of winter here in Chicago, because it, it's, it's not petroleum jelly based. So if they're licking their lips, it's okay. They're not consuming any petroleum je jelly and there's an immediate result. It's like skin lotion for the lips. It is absolutely fantastic. You apply it to the lips, especially in the corners of the lips, especially if their lips are beginning to get, you know, more um, pierced over time, which tends to happen too. It's wonderful for that. And for mid to end stage, if, if, if swallowing certain foods has really become an issue, you can mix it into the food to help break down the foodstuffs. It's odorless, it's tasteless. A lot of the residents and my patients don't even notice that they're, that it's being you know incorporated into their food and they're even able to swallow it. And the end result is wonderful because they're eating the foods that they, they like to eat. Um, another product for those that can, uh, that can swallow or and, and also can re, can um, respond to you know commands for you know rinse and spit is the act dry mouth mouthwash um, that does have fluoride in it so it does help to protect the teeth but the act dry mouth mouthwash it's in a white bottle as well once again it's over the counter usually easier to find online than it is to find in the stores because shelf life is so competitive or the shelf space is so competitive but twice a day, every day, both products have a wonderful additive quality to it, meaning that the more often it's being used, the better it works. So twice a day, every day after brushing, do not rinse with anything afterwards, give it a good five minutes to actually do its thing, um, and then go about your day. Another thing I want to say about biotin is that a lot of people will have a lot of dryness at the end of day, and first thing in the morning. So I tell them to actually keep it on their bedside tables. And do a swig of it. It's the last thing that hits their mouths before their head hits the pillow. And you don't have to go to the bathroom 20 minutes later. You know, it's wonderful because it gets absorbed, you know, in the mouth and, you know, down the throat. And it never even, you know, really makes it to the tummy at that point if they just use a little bit. And first thing in the morning as well. Once again, additive effect. The more often it's used that way, the better it works. They're not waking up hoarse. They're not woken up, uh, waking up with their tongue stuck to their mouths, I've heard sometimes. They're not waking up uh, with sore throats. 
Um, it is a, both of them are wonderful products that I recommend all the time. And usually we, we don't have to go to a prescription format because they're working so well, but they have to be used consistently. Well, that would be good. I would imagine even for somebody who, um, is an open mouth sleeper. You oh know, my God. Yes. Gets a dry throat to, to help them. For sure. Because I would imagine that could wake them up during the night. Now, what about, I've heard about people grinding their teeth and, and I was one of them. I wore my little mouth guard and stuff and I, I don't anymore. I don't think I have that problem. But when I was younger, you know, I stick that thing in, you know, at night. Is that something that you see as an issue for people as well? For Alzheimer patients, for sure. Especially if they've been prescribed Aricept. Oh. Um, if they've been prescribed Aricept, one of the side effects of Aricept is, is daytime bruxism, B-R-U-X-I-S-M, daytime bruxism. And it's really unfortunate because the grinding you can hear down the hall. It is uh, seen, I would probably say, hmm, 40% of the time. Uh, and the, you know, if we, if we, the dosage is lowered, people are concerned that that's going to, you know, potentially speed up the process of, of what's, what they're going through with Alzheimer's. Um, but unfortunately, yes, with that product, there is, with that particular medication, there is a direct, um, result of the side effect being, uh, grinding and clenching their teeth. Um, what can be done about it? Unfortunately, not much. Um, if, if we are in early stage and they're cognizant enough to be able to have a mouth guard made, oh, that is fantastic. There are some wonderful, uh, different shoeys that are on the market and, you know, people can reach out to me afterwards and, and I can send them the link on those products, um, to help prevent, um, any damage, any structural damage to the teeth, AKA fracture. Um, also too, for those that can chew gum, uh, like I said, early stage, or they're just, they've always been gum chewers. So it's a very, uh, common pattern for them to be chewing gum. That is a wonderful way of helping to prevent any damage to the teeth. Uh, but yes, absolutely. And if you've seen your loved one, you know, or anybody, you know, has this problem, it's the medication. Okay. Yeah. Well, I would think too. I mean, I remember, you know, when I had a guard, it was, it was hard yes. and stuff. And you had mentioned like a, a, a gummy kind of one, you would, I would think you'd have to be careful too with that because somebody might not know what that is. And sure. I would think they could, if that got out of whack, they could maybe choke on that. Absolutely. It can totally be a choking hazard, but you always recommend it for the lower arch versus the upper arch. Um, the lower arch is smaller. Um, it's easier to close the lips around gravity keeps it down. Um, okay. and if they're, if they're made by a dentist where a lab is actually custom making this thing, mm -hmm. then it it's, you know, it will be nice in place and your tongue will not be able to get it out. Uh, but once again, these are people that are in, you know, pre or early stage where mm -hmm. they have been immediately prescribed the Aricept and they're seeing those, those, um, side effects happen. Okay. So I've yeah. never heard that being associated with Aricept. So that's, that's a, a nugget for me to, to know. Now I have heard that there's been studies, but I haven't read any of them myself regarding, um, bacteria in oral hygiene mm. and dementia. Have you, are you familiar with any studies and, and thoughts? Absolutely. And I'm, and I'm really glad that you brought that up. Yeah, absolutely. So when the studies first started coming out, they didn't know the difference between the chicken or the egg, meaning they didn't know if, if Alzheimer's uh, was helping to create the, the oral, you know, the oral bacteria uh, because of lack of, of oral hygiene care, keeping up with oral hygiene care, or if the bacteria was actually doing something, you know, um, in the brain that was causing problems. And what they realized is that yes, people, specifically people that have a compromised immune system where the blood brain barrier is not as strong as potentially yours or mine is. Um, so the bacteria, it is called piriformis gingivalis, the bacteria, the main ingredient, the main bacteria that causes gingivitis. We will, for lack of a better way of explaining it, I, I call it overcrowding. The bacteria, you know, they want to find a new place to live. Um, and they get up into the, in, you know, into the brain and plaque, right? Plaque is formed in the mouth. Well, the same plaque is formed in the brain. Granted, there are other proteins that are incorporated in that plaque deposit in brains of those with Alzheimer's. But that being said, 
the bacteria piriformis gingivalis does, does help trigger and promote those plaque formations. Healthier mouths, healthier brains, period. Okay, that, that makes sense. Uh, there's, you know, there's so many um, theories in terms of what causes the disease and stuff. And, and, you know, I had heard, uh, there was one gal I was working with, and I can't remember her name, this was years ago, and she was really pushing this, nobody was really talking about mm -hmm. the importance of it. And, you know, there's so and they still don't talk about it, you know, they talk about lifestyle changes. And this would be a nice one to incorporate with that, because it's something that's habit for most people to begin with. For sure. Well, it, it all comes down to chronic inflammation, right? Mm -hmm. I was just having this discussion with a patient earlier today. What can I do? My grandmother had Alzheimer's. I said, well, you can get tested. You can get genetic testing now to see if you carry mm -hmm. a, a similar gene specifically for Alzheimer's, not vascular dementia, but you can, you know, see if you do. That being said, chronic inflammation, right? And what's chronic inflammation? What is the most common form of chronic inflammation in our bodies? gum disease, gingivitis, itis, inflammation of the gingiva, aka gums. So if we can control this kind of inflammation where our immune systems are not having to fight to keep the opportunistic oral bacteria at bay, we are protecting not only our brains, but our hearts and our lungs as well. Um, I think it's 82% of bacteria and bacterial pneumonia is oral bacteria. We are breathing in we are aspirating in our oral bacteria, especially if the numbers climb because oral care is not being provided on a daily basis. Um, and then of course, with our hearts, there are certain people, it's really been reduced um, on different heart conditions and where people that need to pre-medicate, where they need to take antibiotics prior to a dental cleaning, but it does exist. So mm -hmm. the bacteria that causes cavities, strep mutants, Yes, yeah, strep. It's a cousin of strep throat. Why? Because they're really close to each other. <laughs> but the bacteria, once again, potentially overcrowding, as I like to call it, will make its way through the bloodstream, can get to the heart, and can cause endocarditis, which is inflammation of the inner, innermost layer of the heart, um, muscular layer of the heart. Pretty rare. Uh, we are on top of it. We are aware of that. And once again, you know, we've really reduced the amount of people that need to be taking antibiotics pre, you know, uh, ahead of a dental appointment, specifically a dental cleaning. But suffice to say, you know, it's still being done because it can still happen because it has that bacteria has been found in and around the muscular layers of the heart. So by providing that oral care on a regular basis, not just for our loved ones, but for ourselves as well, hashtag self care. <laughs> We are, we are protecting our hearts, lungs, and brains for sure. And now, you know, and it, the bacteria piriformis gingivalis has not been shown to be a cause of Alzheimer's, but it has been shown to trigger the production of plaque deposits that have already started to form. Okay. Um, one question I wanted to ask is a lot of people don't use your regular toothbrush. You know, they've got the little electric one. If someone is used to that, I'm assuming continue with the Absolutely. electric. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, the electric toothbrush does have, it's more efficient mm -hmm. and does a better job when, versus the manual toothbrush for sure. So if you're, you know, you yourself are familiar with and, and, and prefer to have the electric toothbrush, by all means, continue to use it. I don't recommend trying to start that up with someone who's suffering from Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. It's, it's tough enough trying to promote oral care during that time and coming at them or with them with a toothbrush. Trying to use an, you know, an electric toothbrush or starting off with using an electric toothbrush, something they've had absolutely no experience with, now is not the time to be trying to start that even though it is more efficient in the long run. Just for you know being able to communicate and explaining what that toothbrush is, probably not a good idea. That being said, if that's what they're familiar with, please continue to use it as long as they allow it mm -hmm. because it will do a better job. Okay. For um, sure. And, and then I'm wondering, you know, when someone's diagnosed early on, I'm wondering if it would, it, it, let's say someone's at home and you're yeah. caring for your, your partner, if it would be a good idea to start brushing your teeth together in the bathroom, just because again, you're modeling that whole process. And I know routines are really, really important. 
I, I'm a, you're looking like that's a good idea. I love that idea. I love that idea so much. And I'll tell you why, because not only are you doing the modeling, right? They're, you know, they're following monkey see monkey do, right? They're, they're, they're all you're brushing. So therefore I should be brushing too. Right. But you're also going to be potentially seeing how well they brush. Mm -hmm. Are they bringing that toothbrush even before that? Hold on. Do they, do they recognize their toothbrush? Mm -hmm. Are they applying toothpaste to their toothbrush? Can they? Can they? Um, can they bring their toothbrush to their mouth? Once the toothbrush is in the mouth, are they just sucking on the toothpaste or are they actually going around and brushing the teeth? So it's a wonderful way, twofold. One, to have them model you in, in brushing their teeth, but also number two, you can see how well they're brushing their teeth. So if they do need some additional support, you finish your mouth and say, you know what? I don't think you got that upper right side. I'm going to, I think I'm going to, maybe I'm going to help you brush your upper right side. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the two of you hand over hand, do it together. Or maybe, you know, you'll offer to take the toothbrush from them and then you do it for them once you tell show do. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful, wonderful uh, question. And yes, I think that's a fantastic um, habit to start. The other thing I'm just going to mention, because this happens a lot mm -hmm. and people don't think about it. But when it's time to brush the teeth, only have the toothpaste because people have yep. put on creams, um, preparation, age stuff for rashes, all kinds of stuff. And they're like ah, this, you know, and, and sometimes they don't even know. Right. And and their loved one will catch them at that. So, you know, make sure that that is separate oh, and for it's sure. your own thing, because I can tell you that happens all, all the time, lot. all the time, a lot, a lot, a lot. Now. For some people, let's say with my mom, um, let's say you can't get her to brush, she won't let you. What do you think of the swabs versus, you know, just swishing stuff around in her mouth? Because she couldn't swish, you know, she just, she's like, Oop. you know, yeah, she'd, yeah, yeah. she'd be drinking it, you know. So what are some thoughts in terms of other techniques as the disease, you know, um, processes if, if they're, if they're starting to get combative and agitated? I would try to start off with a child's toothbrush. Mm -hmm. or an extra soft toothbrush. And okay. this is the reason why we still want the um, sway of the toothbrush. We still mm -hmm. want those bristles trying to get stuff off. Yes, the in a worst case scenario, if the only thing that you can get into that, you know, to your loved one or to the resident's mouth is a swab, fine. Um, I want it dipped in, in mouthwash. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, I obviously alcohol free mouthwash, cause we don't want them consuming alcohol. We want a hydrogen peroxide based mouthwash or hydrogen peroxide in water. Um, something that will be an antiseptic mm -hmm. to help promote, um, you know, good, uh, something that's going to irritate the, the bacteria. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and also to brush, you know, food stuff away. Um, a concern for me is for people with ALS and for people who do clench because I don't want them biting on the swab. And then you try to pull it out. And now that swab is in the person's mouth. Yep. That is a huge choking hazard. Very, very, almost impossible to happen with a toothbrush. So I would, instead of the, okay, so we've started with the electric toothbrush. That's, mm -hmm. that's a no-go. We're in, onto a regular toothbrush. That's a no-go. I would try to go even smaller. I would try to do a child's toothbrush or an extra soft toothbrush. And even then, if all you're getting is the outside I'm, I'm totally cool with that. And then yes, if, if we're in, if we're in hospice and, and it's just not happening and we need to go to a swab, that's fine. But I don't want that swab to be dry. I want to make sure that at the very least we have, you know, once again, some kind of antiseptic on it that's alcohol free that can help promote, um, you know, good, a good oral environment. And if nothing else on the, on the insides, um, you know, in the front of the mouth, yeah. or the front of the teeth. Yeah. And I, I even think of my mom, she probably would have been open to just a wet toothbrush with baking soda. Cause when she was young, that's what they did. If they ran out of toothpaste. For sure. For sure. And, yeah. And so that, that might be a familiar um, piece to her. And the other thing I would say is a lot of times when people are brushing, they're not holding the face as they're doing it. And so if someone's moving, cause my mom would say, get that stick out of my mouth. That's what she'd be screaming at the yeah. staff. They keep jabbing me with the stick. Yeah. You know, and so there wasn't, you know, when you're holding someone's face, I mean, there's a sense of compassion mm. too that comes across. And again, if you're having eye contact and you're smiling gently at them, and if you're, you're explaining what you're doing, 
you know, your, your eyes and your smile can, can really so lower much. the anxiety. Yeah. Immensely. Yeah. On that. yeah. So, um, anything else that, that I, I didn't think of that we should talk about? Um, hoarding food. Oh yeah. Right. So that's another thing too, that we need to be checking on a, on a regular basis, especially for those that have not, um, that can't really communicate with us anymore. We know that potentially they have swallowing issues, but it hasn't really become a problem where they're choking. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would be better, very beneficial to make sure where we do a, a pull and make sure there's no food being trapped in there, specifically after breakfast. That tends to be a very common time for food because food tends to be softer. So we'll see eggs, we'll see oatmeal, the like, where food is now being packed in the mouth. There are a, a plethora of theories behind it, but there are dental ones as well. And one of them is because they can't feel like they can really chew the food and that then therefore they're, they'll, they'll swallow it later. Um, but then it just remains there. And so, um, hoarding food is also something that we need to make sure that our, our loved ones or residents aren't doing. Um, and it's a quick, you know, there, everyone is uh, so afraid of, of getting bit. Mm -hmm. So it's a simple, even if they're clenching, you know, it's a, it's a pull. Mm -hmm. They can't do anything to you, but you can take a really good look mm -hmm. and make sure there's nothing in there. And unfortunately it can start at any time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, you know, you, you think the person has, has finished their food. Um, you know, if you're paying attention, you know, are they really swallowing everything, you know, taking a quick look and then making sure you do a finger swab and you get the food out. Um, unfortunately there really is no cure for that. Um, it's going to be a matter of regular routine checking and, and cleaning out, um, after that meal, but that that's something that's crucial. And another thing to look for is, um, is like you mentioned the word or the term abscess. Mm -hmm. Abscesses are usually asymptomatic, meaning the person either they can or cannot communicate they're, they don't have any pain. And that's because the bacteria that caused it can now breathe oxygen again. And so for it, 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 usually the nerve isn't irritated or for those that are older, mm -hmm. nerves and teeth tend to die out. And that's a normal stage of aging where the, the, the tooth is technically dead, where the nerve is no longer um, active and being able to tell the difference between something hot or cold. That's normal. Um, however, what we also want to be looking for, especially for those people that have had a lot of dental work, is dropping the lip, looking to see if you see any target lesion, just like the target logo for the superstore, mm -hmm. right? It's going to be red, white, red. They can either be, they either be red or it could be a white, like a white head, like a zit. Mm -hmm. And it's usually in the inside. So in the inside here in the fold of the mouth, either lower or upper, they happen both same amount of frequency, front, back, it doesn't really tend to matter. But, you know, if there is a concern and when is it time to really call a dentist, you think you're, you're providing good oral care for your loved one, your loved one can go to the dentist, but if you're providing the oral care when is it time to reach out and have someone take a look at it, specifically dental, it would be an abscess. Why? Because that bacteria is now spreading through the bloodstream and horrible to say, but it can lead to sepsis. Mm -hmm. So we really want to make sure that that is being taken care of. And I would probably say close to 90% of the time, uh, uh, found pretty quickly within the first 72 hours, antibiotics should kick it. Okay. What yeah. about canker sores? You know, uh, um, yeah, we do see canker sores too in, in, in the mouth and, and, and the best thing, once again, canker sores also can be in relation to dry mouth as well. Okay. So if the mouth is dry, then the mouth becomes irritated, the mouth becomes irritated, then the tissue becomes irritated and then canker sores can definitely form a well, wonderful, wonderful product. Um, and once again, people can reach out to me afterwards, or, you know, we can talk about it right now. A wonderful over the counter product is called Gly Oxide, G L I hyphen or G L Y hyphen O X I D E. It's great because it's got a nozzle on it. It's a little tube with a pointy end to it's plastic. And you can apply 10 drops. It tells you to do this, but 10 drops, it'll foam up. It's alcohol free. It can be swallowed. It's pH neutral. 10 drops and then put it in. It has a slight taste to it, but it does not burn. So it's not going to irritate um, you, me, 
uh, or your loved one. And, and it will over time help to get rid of it. And if for someone is prone to canker sores, it has a preventative quality. It will tell you to do 10 drops on your tongue every day. Let it, you know, foam up, kind of get it around your mouth. And even if they can't get it around their mouth, they're getting the 10 drops on the tongue every day. That is a wonderful way to help prevent canker sores. As for cold sores that are, that are around the lip, unfortunately, you would need a prescription for that. And sometimes if they are in the corners of the lips, that's called angular chelitis. And that is a fungal infection where the mouth is so dry, the fungus are trying to find a moist environment. We're licking the lips. They tend to come out to the sides of the, of the lips and then a prescription antifungal would need to be prescribed and it gets rid of it every single time. But if the mouth is moist and if the lips are moist, it won't happen. My gosh, you are just a wealth of information. I have learned so much today. I, I really appreciate the time that you've taken. Anytime. Now you, you have your own practice, which is called Joyful Dental Care in Chicago yes. land. Yeah. And do you want to talk just briefly about home visits that you do as well as people coming into practice? Absolutely. Absolutely. So people can reach out to me. It's 773-736-7767. People can reach out to me at that phone number or my email address. And it goes to me directly, but it, it's like this because it's HIPAA compliant. It's office at joyfuldentalcare.com. Joyful with one L, office at joyfuldentalcare.com. You can reach out to me that way. And, and what normally happens is that any information that is provided, like I said, by email is HIPAA compliant. So we don't have to worry about that. A phone call is made. And then my front desk coordinator will do a, a slight triage to find out what is going on, what the needs are, where located. And then from there, um, an appointment is made and then I will go to the home or nursing home. I do make regular house calls as well. Um, if someone needs a tooth extracted and is on blood thinners, we do have to reach out to get written, in, in Illinois, we need written medical clearance from the um, person who is prescribing the blood thinner. So if that's a PA or a cardiologist, whomever it is, we need written medical clearance saying that this person is medically competent, including people on hospice. If there is a tooth that is a problem, specifically a loose tooth, we don't want them to aspirate a tooth. Mm -hmm. um, so then we do need written medical clearance saying, yes, this person is medically competent for me to go in and remove this tooth appropriately to prevent uh, choking. Okay, sounds good. And then if they're interested in just dental education, you know, if you're if you're a clinic, if you're a facility, if, if you are, a, you know, college and want to get those those students trained. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. Do you speak with families at conferences and things like that as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I was just invited to do um, a speaking engagement with occupational therapists, which I thought was Yay. fantastic. Right. How, how brilliant is that? Um, yes. So that would be my website, joypostcosmdds.com. Oh, excuse me, <clears throat> joypostcosmdds.com. On there, you will find my speaker packet and to uh, which, you know, to any, for those that are in organizations or are um, in a nursing home environment um, or other uh, healthcare providers that would like me to come and speak and educate about the importance of oral care and also signs and symptoms of what to be looking for when they themselves potentially are doing house calls, I would be more than happy to provide that service. Okay. And then if they wanted to go to your website for your dentistry, that's joyfuldentalcare.com. And well, they can also set up appointments online that way as well. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. This has just been really, really informative. And I, I can't thank you enough for all you shared with us. Lots of great detail and um, over the counter referrals for, for different things that can help. Um, lots of techniques. Um, so uh, keep going at it because boy, you, you are right. This is an area that is underserved. Mm. And um, really, we need to up the ante in terms thank of service for, for our elders and people with dementia. So thank you so much, Joy. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.